Um, really, what I'm going to be saying to you this afternoon is really very simple, but I think hugely um, important. The one big thing I want to convey is that the crucial element of your leadership is your character. That character is the absolutely essential requirement for Christian leadership. Um, secular organisations increasingly recognise the importance of character, but it is absolutely foundational and central to the biblical and Christian uh, understanding of leadership. So what do we mean by character? Well, I've defined character there as meaning habitual behaviours resulting from habitual dispositions of the heart. So character is the way that we normally react, the way that we normally relate to others because of a pattern that is set in our heart that is then worked out in our behaviour. In other words, this will be the normal way that we will um, respond, uh, react um, and relate. And uh, the character, therefore, is, is what we expect of people. Now, um, we can then talk about people who act out of character, um, but the very fact that they're acting out of character is because it's not usual. It's not the way that we normally expect them to behave. And really what I want to say is simply uh, developing character is absolutely crucial to uh, Christian uh, leadership. Jen was saying in our earlier session, that the Bible is filled with examples of leaders who were flawed um, or who in some cases fell very significantly. And generally um, the uh, causes of their falling or their failure uh, was not because of lack of gifting, not because they had a lack of skills or abilities to do the job that God had called them to, but because of failure of their character. We can see that in people like, um, as Jen mentioned, Eli, Samuel, Saul, David, Solomon. You might think of King Herod. You might think of someone like Demas who loved the world and abandoned Paul. Lots of examples of failures uh, in leadership. And at one level, we shouldn't expect leaders to be perfect. No leader will be perfect because only the Lord Jesus is a perfect leader. But we do see some of these leaders falling into spectacular uh, failures of ministry that discredit uh, God, uh, his word and his people. And it's because of a, a flaw of character. We can see that in the Bible. We see it in church history. And very sadly, I think we've seen that uh, in uh, flawed leaders um, in the recent period. One of the things I've been struck by in this last uh, couple of years is the exposure of a number of leaders who were well known, who had public ministries that were very much appreciated and commended, who have been exposed um, as flawed and fallen. And uh, it, it, those flaws have not been the result of a lack of gifting. Often they are leaders who have been incredibly gifted, but what's been exposed is a failing of uh, character. Um, uh, in some cases, uh, it may well be that the longer that they were in ministry, the more that they neglected issues of character and allowed issues of character to uh, slip. But they've clearly discredited themselves, hurt other people and discredited um, the gospel. Now, you may know some of these. You may not know um, who they are exactly. I'm sorry if I'm triggering for anybody who um, has had any dealings with um, any of these people, but just some that have been in public attention, certainly um, some worldwide, some in, in my context particularly. Many of us will have been grieved to see that Ravi Zacharias has been exposed as a serial sexual offender, um, uh, abusing others, um, uh, abusing finances, owning massage parlours, uh, hiding himself from accountability, has called into a question the whole um, uh, sort of ministry that he conducted, has for many undermined the truth of the gospel. Um, his deceit has included kind of claiming false qualifications, uh, a tragic uh, end um, to his ministry. Steve Timmis, who was um, global CEO of Act 29, was removed from his role by Act 29 because of allegations of spiritual bullying. And again, similarly in a church context in the UK, um, uh, was found to have coercively controlled people in the life of the church particularly fellow leaders. He was brilliant at caring for vulnerable and weak people in the life of the church, but uh, found it very difficult to relate to leaders who were in any way threatening him. 
Uh, John Smythe, most of you will never have heard of, but he was a leader in camps in England for men, young, young men from kind of some of the most expensive schools, some of the top universities. And he gathered a group of young men around him who he persuaded that he would be able to help them to attain to higher levels of sanctification. And he did it by uh, beating them uh, horribly um, and mercilessly. Uh, it's an absolutely appalling scandal of uh, leadership. And uh, Jonathan Fletcher, who uh, was a leading uh, vicar within um, uh, the UK, a great preacher who had huge influence for many, many years, again, um, was exposed um, as someone who had been involved in, in bullying uh, members of his congregation, leaders and vulnerable uh, people. Um, and again, taking part in, to a lesser degree, kind of naked beatings, naked uh, kind of massage. Both of those cases, John Smythe and Jonathan Fletcher, involved what, what was clearly some element of homosexual behaviour that was uh, involved in um, the activities, which is a reminder to us that not all temptation in Christian ministry takes a heterosexual um, form. Now, those are some particularly uh, egregious cases of character failures in ministry. It's not a lack of gifting. It's been a failure of character. Um, but there are many other cases that I could take you to that are no, nowhere near as significant or as publicly known. In my role leading FIEC, I'm responsible for over 600 churches, over 500 pastors. Tragically, year on year, we have multiple failures uh, in ministry. There will be those who have affairs or commit adultery. There will be um, those who uh, misuse the power that they have to oppress others. There will be those who engage in dishonesty. Uh, for example, um, uh, something we're dealing with at the moment is claims of plagiarism, somebody who was basically just simply preaching other people's sermons and not fulfilling the responsibilities of their ministry. Um, again, very often, not failures of uh, gifting, but failures of character. And certainly over 11 years, I've seen far more people um, uh, who have to leave ministry because of failings of character than because they weren't gifted um, for the job um, that they had been given. So I think this is a hugely important area, and it's therefore one that none of us can, um, in a sense, think about without saying we ourselves are vulnerable. We're all uh, flawed sinners. We are all capable of failing to keep a focus on maintaining a godly character which is why it's so important that we understand that this is at the very heart of uh, Christian ministry. And I want to suggest actually this is the biggest stream of teaching in the New Testament about leadership. The Bible says far more about the character of leaders than it does about issues of uh, um, uh, gifting or uh, than it does about the precise way that you should lead. The great Bible emphasis is on the importance of uh, character. Because if you've got the right character, then combined with gifts, you'll be able to discern the way to lead in multiple contexts. It's character that is foundational. We see that, um, I think, first of all, in relation to Jesus teaching and example. What we see um, in Jesus teaching and example is that he emphasizes that leadership is all about serving. This is the great emphasis of New Testament teaching about leadership. Leadership is about serving um, others. Uh, leadership inevitably carries with it power and authority. So leaders, by definition, have power and authority over others. That might be formal power, or it might be informal power because of their influence, their charisma, their abilities. But either way, they have power to be able to um, uh, sort of say what others should do. And of course, the great thing for leaders is that because they have that power, that power can be used um, in uh, inappropriate ways. People who have power are tempted to use that power for their own benefit, to, as it were, enjoy the privileges of power, to exploit the opportunities um, that it uh, brings. That is power used in a self-serving way. And Jesus uh, says um, that rather than using power in that way to serve ourselves, we are to use power to serve others. Power is to be applied 
to the service of others. And Jesus turns the teaching of the world completely on its head. So for Jesus to be great uh, is not to be someone who is set above others to enjoy the privileges of being set above others. No, to be great is instead to become a slave who serves others. We find that in Matthew 20, 20 28, which Jen referred to, uh, where Jesus talks about how we're not to be as Christian leaders, like the, the, the pagans, the Gentiles, who want to lord it over others, who want the top positions, who want the status and the recognition. Instead, we're to be willing to be slaves who serve uh, others. And of course, it's Jesus who's the supreme example of that. He's the supreme example of having absolute power, yet making himself a slave to serve others by going to his death on the cross. That's what uh, Jesus says um, in uh, the Gospels. He doesn't come to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. And of course, Paul emphasizes this aspect of Jesus' character in Philippians chapter two, especially that great hymn where Paul speaks about how Jesus, although he was equal with God, humbled himself to become a servant, a slave, and to be obedient to death, even death on a cross. And that was how Jesus uh, served our arts. So Jesus teaching an example is that leadership and the power and authority that goes with it is to be used in service of others, not simply uh, for yourself. And I think it's important to remember here that when we think of humility, in the Bible, humility is not pretending that you're not good at things. We can have a false view of humility that says humility is pretending not to be very able. Other people are better at kind of doing yourself down. Now, humility in the Bible is not that. Humility is recognising your duty to serve others. But all the gifts you've been given by God are to be used in service uh, of other people. So um, Jesus teaching an example is that um, the character quality we need is this willingness to serve others, not to um, serve ourselves. Um, you'll forgive me in the time, I'm not reading these Bible passages out in detail. I'm taking it for granted that you know most of them. And as leaders, you're familiar with them. You can, of course, go away and reflect on them and meditate on them personally um, at, at a later stage. There's some emphasis on character for leadership is also found embedded in Paul's teaching, uh, particularly in the New Testament, where he's speaking about what the character uh, qualities are, what the qualifications are for church leadership. So in the pastoral epistles in particular, Paul is concerned that the right people be appointed to lead uh, local churches. And so he lays out the criteria that are to be um, used to determine who should be appointed as leaders. Well, what's really striking in 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 10, where Paul talks about elders and he talks about deacons uh, and what to look for in the people who, who are to be appointed in the life of the church. Um, the key thing is um, uh, that they are to have right character qualities. There's very little said about gifting. Gifting in a way is taken for granted. So for the um, elders, they are to be able to teach. But that's pretty much the only mention about um, a, a, a kind of gifting. Uh, in, instead, that the focus is on the character qualities that the uh, persons are to observe. So here I've just distilled out what the qualities are that Paul identifies here for an elder, but it's very, very similar for um, deacons uh, as uh, well. And uh, 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 he says that um, in order to be appointed as a church leader in this senior position of oversight, you're to be someone who's faithful to your wife, uh, kind of a one woman man, as it puts it literally. You're to be temperate, to be uh, sober, to be um, self-controlled, not given to a uh, temper, to be um, respectable, to be hospitable and generous and willing to share with others. Some of them are, are, are expressed negatively. You're not to be given to drunkenness and not to be given to violence. You're to be gentle. You're not to be quarrelsome and not to be a lover 
of money. And uh, I don't know whether you notice this, but the vast majority of these character qualities are essentially about the way that you relate to other people, how you treat um, other people, and especially how you relate to other people when you find them difficult or when you disagree with them. So how will you respond where they don't agree with you? Will you lose your temper or will you um, be gentle? Will you seek to build unity or will you generate uh, quarrels? So here are a set of character qualities. And as I said at the beginning, these are habitual behaviors. You're to be habitually faithful, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, not drunk, not violent, gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of uh, money. Whatever situation you're in, no matter how difficult or how testing, these are the ways that you are expected as a norm um, uh, to respond. And uh, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 3 verses 1 to 10 emphasizes that when you're appointing people to leadership, certainly these senior leadership positions, these character qualities are meant to have already been demonstrated. They're things that should be obvious. They are recognized by the community. So uh, uh, you, they are seen in the way that you, you lead your family. They're recognized even by the unbelievers who are around you. So it's, it's quite clear that what Paul is saying there is that these are the absolutely crucial qualities for being um, a leader. If you don't have these qualities, then you will misuse your gifts. In fact, uh, I think the New Testament um, teaching is very much that gifts without character will actually lead to damage to the body of Christ and the mission of God. Gifts are incredibly dangerous if they are not used um, with character. We see that um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to 14, where the Corinthians are very proud of their spiritual gifts and how gifted they are, but they're not using them in a way that's loving and that seeks to build others up. In effect, they're not serving with their gifts. They're using their gifts for their own pride and status. They don't have these character qualities. So gifts without character are dangerous. And in, in Christian ministry, we need to recognize that the means never justify the ends. Sometimes we can fall into thinking that we can kind of forgive people their character flaws because of what they get done, that we can overlook their failings because of their giftedness and their ability to deliver. Um, that um, is a, a very dangerous situation uh, to be in. Character needs to come first as a, a prerequisite. You can say we can see the very similar things in Titus, uh, where Paul again speaks about the criteria for um, church elders and leaders. Philippians chapter four, verses four um, and seven, again speak about the need for gentleness and prayer, a dependence on God and a gentleness in the way that you deal um, uh, with others. So character is absolutely um, central. The same is um, uh, emphasised by Peter in his teaching. So uh, Peter um, equally stresses the vital importance of uh, character to leadership. At the end of uh, his letter, uh, 1 Peter, which I think is a hugely relevant letter for Christians today, it's dealing with the challenge of being a tiny minority in a hostile world under pressure. Um, in that context, leaders are crucial to help God's people to stand firm and fulfill their mission to be a, a kingdom of priests sharing the good news up with the world. Peter, towards the end of his letter, speaks specifically to leaders in the church, again, to pastors or elders in the life of the church. When he speaks to them about their service and their work, again, it's character that's primarily emphasised. So he urges them that they are to be shepherds of the flock, which carries the idea of that they are to be caring for the people who are under them. The uh, picture of a shepherd is the main biblical picture of leadership. And the task of the shepherd is to lead the flock, to ensure that the flock is fed properly, to take them to good pasture and fresh water. 
It's uh, to make sure that the flock is protected from uh, wild animals, and it's to bind up the, uh, the weak and the wounded amongst the sheep. The job of the shepherd is to care for the flock in all of those ways. His task is to see that the flock is healthy and the flock is growing. And the Bible condemns those shepherds and leaders who abuse the flock uh, and exploit the flock for themselves. Um, uh, leaders are to be willing uh, to serve. Uh, they need to be um, willing to take this responsibility on themselves. They've not been forced into it, and nor are they doing it out of a kind of selfish ambition. They're to be eager to serve others. Um, and the warning here is this is paired with not gaining dishonestly. There have been times in Christian ministry in which being a Christian minister is a way to um, be financially well rewarded. That's probably less the case in many places in Europe today. It's still the case in some countries where pastors and leaders may be paid very large amounts of money. Um, uh, uh, but Paul says, don't be, uh, so Peter says, don't be seeking dishonest gain, but instead be uh, eager to serve. And then he says, be an example to the flock. The way that you're to lead is by showing people how they should be living, not acting as a dictator who lords it over them. So there we've got um, uh, uh, this pattern of biblical leadership in which character is central. Uh, leadership is service. Um, you need to have character qualities so that you use your gifts in the right way. And that's consistent across the teaching of um, the New Testament. And I think that those um, passages of the Bible that we've just looked at, they are great as a, a way of almost having a personal audit of your own leadership. I don't know whether you audit your own leadership, what, uh, what you're doing, whether you're doing it well, how, um, what you're accomplishing. Maybe you are involved in some kind of appraisal process where others help you to evaluate your leadership. Well, if we're going to evaluate our leadership, whether individually or um, through some appraisal process, we need to make sure that we are auditing these character qualities. Now, that's um, a really big ask. And so um, the crucial point where the rubber hits the road is how on earth can we make sure we have character like that? What will help us to develop the right character? What will um, enable us uh, not to um, allow our character to deteriorate or to neglect it? Well, again, um, it's not particularly complicated, but it seems to me that these are things that leaders are all too prone to forget. They're things we neglect, possibly because of all the pressures and the demands that are on it. But they are absolutely crucial to developing and maintaining the character that we need. First of all, if we want to have this kind of character, we need to keep being taught by God's word. It's absolutely crucial that we as leaders are those who are being taught and instructed by God's word. So 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17, crucial verse that virtually everyone in Christian ministry will know very well. All scripture is God breathed and useful teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Now, I think sometimes as Christian leaders, we think this is a verse that tells us what to do for others. And we read it and we find ourselves to be the ones who are teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness. But in actual fact, this is a verse for us. We need to be taught, rebuked, corrected and trained in righteousness by the word. This verse is actually talking about how the servant of God, which in the Bible probably means the prophet or the minister, will be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It's, it's a word that's really encouraging because it tells us that scripture is sufficient to equip us. You don't need to have read all the latest management material. Um, uh, the scriptures will be able to equip you for every good work. That doesn't mean it isn't helpful to read other things, but we need to have confidence that scripture is supremely capable of equipping us because it is God's word. And if we're to maintain our character, we are going to need all of those four things to be taught so we learn new things, to be rebuked where we're going wrong, to be corrected and to be trained so that we can go in the right way. So we need to be those who first and foremost are under scripture 
a hearing scripture and allowing scripture to speak to our own lives. I think this means that as Christian leaders, uh, character formation, a crucial part of that, will be putting ourselves under God's word. That may mean our regular daily um, devotions of uh, reading the word for ourselves and prayerfully applying it to our lives, allowing God to speak to us. It will certainly mean sitting under the ministry of the church and being taught by others. One of the things that totally shocks me with many of our pastors that I engage with is how many have stopped reading the Bible for themselves and are only ever reading it to prepare for the sermons uh, and the talks that they're giving. They are always speakers of God's word. They are never hearers of God's word. And it's not surprising that if we neglect scripture for ourselves, then um, our character will deteriorate. So make scripture and sitting under scripture and listening to scripture central to your life and ministry. If you're in um, Christian leadership and you're not regularly part of a church, you're not regularly being taught God's word, you need to put that right because I think you're heading on a very dangerous path. Secondly, we need um, to be those uh, who um, have a vibrant personal spiritual life of fighting sin. We need to fight sin in our own lives. Um, uh, the battle for character is part of the battle of the spiritual life. Um, uh, uh, and Paul describes that, I think, very clearly in Galatians chapter five. But essentially, um, in the Christian life, there's a battle on between the desires of our flesh, our fallen human nature, and the work of the spirit who is now indwelling it. And in order to live the Christian life, we need to crucify and put to death the desires of the flesh, which will lead to all sorts of wrong ways of relating to others that are selfish and not serving. And in contrast, we need to walk by the spirit. And uh, that means living under the influence, the direction, the power of God's Holy Spirit dwelling in our lives. And the work of the spirit in us as we do those two things of crucifying and walking will produce fruit. And that fruit is essentially the character qualities that the spirit will bring about. So we are all very familiar with the fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's worth noting that in Galatians, those are all seen as one thing. So it's not the case that you can pick some of those off and say, I'm okay with those, but I don't mind about the others. It's not like that. This is a totality of the kind of character you're meant to have. And in the context of Galatians, it's quite clear that these qualities, these fruit, are again all about the way you relate to other people. We think about them often very first as the way that we relate to God, but they're not. They're directed on the way we relate to one another within the community of God's people. So we need to be loving others. We need to be joyful for others. We need to be at peace with others, patient with others, kind to others, good and generous to others, faithful to others, gentle with others, and exercise a self-control so we don't damage others. This uh, picture of the Christian life is describing a daily battle. And if we're not fighting it, then our character um, will uh, be flawed uh, and that will be deeply damaging potentially for um, our ministries. And then lastly, just to summarize it all, 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, Paul is able to say to uh, the uh, Corinthians, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. That's the pattern of leadership that we're wanting here, a leadership that follows the example of Christ. And if you're a Christian leader, you ought to be able to say this to others. You ought to be able to say, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. And if we can't say that, there is something that we ought to be dealing with in our character. Um, we can't simply allow ourselves to be making excuses for ourselves. We need instead to be uh, developing that Christ-like model that others can follow. So just to um, summarise, uh, what I really want to say is character is crucial. Um, uh, if your character is not right, then that can have devastating impact 
for your ministry, for others, uh, for the reputation of um, the gospel. So um, I hope this has simply encouraged you to make character a priority. And if in thinking about this, you've realised that your character has been slipping or you've not made it the focus that it ought to be, then can I urge you to take action? Maybe what you need to do is, is to repent, to recognise that you've not made character a priority. And so you need to change and start focusing on character. Maybe that might involve a period of recovering. Perhaps you need to take a break, take some time from ministry to be able to reassemble your character and regain the character of Christ and desire to serve others rather than serve yourself. It's possible that for some leaders, they've reached such a point that they really need to resign and step back from ministry because they haven't got the right character to be able to um, keep serving at this moment. Or maybe they've fallen in ways that means that they shouldn't continue in ministry because their character flaw has been exposed. I hope that's not true for any of you, but if it is, please take the action that is needed. But it's vital we keep asking ourselves these questions so we guard our own hearts and we don't fall into those dangers.